Look, thanks uh, so much, John, for the kind introduction. It's uh, always weird when you have your life story read out to an audience before you take the microphone. The, uh, the one thing that you left out is I've been playing the bagpipes for 30 years. So in uh, the good tradition, I want to say thanks to uh, uh, Pipe Major Ogilvy who, uh, who piped us in. I don't know if you're still in the room, but uh, look, I wanted to say thank you for the music. <laughs> look, uh, folks, before I get into some of the, uh, the efforts we're putting forward to address the housing crisis, I just want to take a minute to reflect on what an enormous opportunity uh, we have before us here in Canada. Uh, when I think about why we do the jobs that we do, uh, it's to increase the quality of life that Canadians get to enjoy. And when I think about the strategic advantages that Canada has, there is not another country in the world, in my view, that has a stronger outlook. Uh, over the next five years, uh, we have uh, the most educated workforce in the world. Uh, we've got natural resources that would make our competitor economies globally blush. Uh, we've got trade networks that are so strong that we're the only G7 economy with a trading relationship with every other G7 economy. Uh, we've got transportation infrastructure that opens markets to Europe, to Africa, to Asia, uh, to every corner uh, of the world. Uh, it's extraordinary what we see before us, uh, but if we're going to make the most of the advantage, including the transition to a clean economy with uh, a low emissions grid uh, where the world is going, uh, we've got to make sure that people have an opportunity to participate in that economy. Uh, one of the enormous bottlenecks uh, that I see right now is the housing shortage uh, that we're dealing with if we're going to maximize our economic potential. If we're able to solve the supply gap and make sure that people can find a place to live that they can actually afford, we're going to create an opportunity for an entire generation of Canadians to uh, enjoy uh, prosperity that currently uh, feels like it's uh, beyond so many's reach. We are living through a housing crisis. Uh, over the course of the last eight and a half months, I've had the extraordinary privilege to talk to the people who are going to solve it. I know in the introduction, John, you mentioned I may have a lot of people's ears. Uh, the ones who are making the bigger, biggest difference today are not the ones who work alongside me in Parliament Hill. It's the people who are building homes. It's the people who are running community housing operations. It's people who know the nature of what their own city needs. It's people who have been on the ground working to implement solutions for the last generation. They know how to solve the problem. And if there's one takeaway uh, from the conversations that I've had over the course of the limited time I've, I've had this particular position, it's that the crisis can be solved. We're going to solve it because we know we have to. Over the course of the next few days, we're going to be uh, releasing a plan to address the housing crisis that will involve a comprehensive set of policies. It's going to seek to do three specific things. Uh, one is to build more homes. Uh, the second is to make sure that it's easier for people to rent or buy a home in this country. And the third is to make sure that those who cannot afford a home uh, have support to make sure that they go to bed with a roof over their head. Now, it's easy to say that these are three things we want to accomplish. It's harder to get it done. Uh, but we're moving in the right direction, in my view, and you would have seen a slew of announcements over the course of not just the past uh, week and a half, but dating back to the early fall. If we're going to reduce, uh, if we're going to build more homes, the first thing we're going to do is reduce the cost of home building. It is extremely expensive to build a home in Canada. The cost of materials and supplies have gone up. The cost of labor, land, interest have gone up. We've got significant pressures on communities, and they've responded in many instances to increasing development charges, which makes it more expensive to build homes as well. Despite these challenges, I think there's an opportunity for us to do what we can federally and to leverage provincial investments to bring down the cost of home building. We have removed the GST on new apartment construction and looking at further measures that will help reduce the cost of building for home builders. We're also moving forward with new investments and low-cost financing to help combat a high interest rate environment to ensure that as pressure is being felt across the economy, uh, those who are actually uh, building homes still have an opportunity to make the math work. But we don't just put money on the table and walk away. We insist on certain commitments, including on affordability, by ensuring a certain number of the units in the buildings that we finance or offer at prices that are based on what a middle class worker can actually afford. Now, there's more that we can do when it comes to affordability, or rather, uh, bring down the cost of housing, uh, including leveraging uh, more public lands. Uh, the plan that we're going to put forward is going to have a shift in our approach to get more homes built so we can reduce the input costs when it comes to building by leveraging federal lands that we have available and doing more to help other levels of government piggyback on this national effort. Now, it's not enough for us just to reduce the cost of housing, uh, or rather the cost of building. Uh, we also have to make it easier for home builders to build. There's a lot of folks who tell me when they write their pro formas in the first instance and submit their uh, application for a permit, uh, if it takes a year and a half to get approved, uh, the math doesn't work anymore. We're working with cities right across the country, including here in Ottawa, to reduce uh, the permitting times for these projects with investments through the Housing Accelerator Fund. 
We're also incentivizing new kinds of measures that will make it easier to build homes and different kinds of homes in neighborhoods that previously would only allow single family homes. We can put more incentives on the table, including the recently announced $6 billion municipal infrastructure fund for housing enabling infrastructure, water and wastewater in particular, in exchange for commitments from cities and provinces to make it easier to build homes and cheaper to maintain that infrastructure. When we actually think about uh, the density challenges that, or density opportunities uh, that we can implement, we have an opportunity to create more homes near transit, near post-secondary institutions, where infrastructure already exists, where services that people need already exist, and where job opportunities are available today, and more will be there tomorrow. And if we actually incentivize this kind of density, we're not just going to create more livable communities. We're going to reduce the cost for municipal governments by making sure we're maximizing the capacity of the infrastructure that already exists and reducing the cost of maintenance that can explode if the strategy for growth is purely urban sprawl. Now, in addition to the infrastructure investments and the housing accelerator fund, uh, we also have to grow the capacity of the Canadian workforce to build the homes that we need. I fear right now uh, that if we have a perfect set of financial policies, a perfect set of municipal zoning policies, faster permitting across Canada, we're still going to hit a ceiling pretty soon on the number of homes that Canadian industry can build. Now, this isn't the fault of industry. They're the ones who are actually going to help solve the housing crisis in a lot of ways. But we need to help them grow at a pace faster than they've experienced over the last number of years. There's a number of ways that we can help do this. We can continue to support, in a, a scaled-up way, new training initiatives so we can grow the Canadian home-building workforce. We can embrace targeted immigration programs to make sure that those who are coming here have the opportunity to help solve a major, major social problem and create enormous economic opportunities for our communities. But if we continue to build homes, uh, more or less the same way that we have over the last number of decades, we're not going to be able to leverage the full capacity. I was in Calgary, a city I used to call home with the Prime Minister last week to announce new supports that are going to help scale up home building factories in this country. We're going to do this by incentivizing the adoption of new technology, working with the regional development agencies to actually highlight and support those factories that are primed for growth. And importantly, uh, listening to the advice of those who run factories today who tell me the number one thing they need is orders. We're going to earmark half a billion dollars to the apartment construction loan program for new buildings that will be uh, manufactured in a prefabricated uh, factory. Uh, this has an opportunity to significantly increase the scale of home building. And when we layer that on top of the previously announced uh, home design catalog, we're going to be able to achieve economies of scale that will drive costs down and increase the volume of home production. These factories today are producing homes at a competitive cost, but twice as fast as traditional built homes. It's an enormous opportunity not only to help solve the housing crisis, but to create significant economic opportunities by putting Canadians to work in the process. Now, we can't just look at the need to build more homes. That's uh, one of the most important parts of the equation. But we also, ha also have to make sure that we've got our minds turned to the very real impact that people who don't see a future for themselves in the Canadian housing market are feeling today. There's a lot of people, particularly younger people in this country today, uh, almost everyone my age and younger, when I talk to my friends, is trying to figure out not whether they're going to be able to afford their dream home one day, but whether they can pay rent from the place that they already have now. I can tell you there's people who are very close to me, uh, one in particular, uh, who just had her fourth baby. Uh, she's been told by her landlord, but because he had to refinance the place that she's renting, her rent's going to go up 1200 bucks. She's got a six-month-old at home. She's an artist. Her husband uh, does roof repair. Is it reasonable for her to be able to take on another 1200 bucks right now? The conversation they're having is whether they're both going to be returning to work full-time with a six-month-old at home, when they should be cherishing those moments with their new addition. Uh, instead, uh, they're focused on whether they can afford to stay in the same place that they're currently living. We can change this opportunity by making it easier to rent and creating an opportunity for people to see home ownership in their future. Now, we've announced a series of measures around a, home, uh, a renter's bill of rights, uh, around uh, an opportunity for, to establish uh, uh, new protections, to crack down on rent evictions, creating a standard form lease that will put a floor under people who are renting in this country. We're also moving forward to help people transition towards home ownership because we believe that if you pay your rent on time every month, that should count for something. And for those people who don't have an established credit history but want to use it to get into a home, we want to work with fintechs around this country, which will again drive economic opportunity for Canada by allowing their rent history to count towards their credit. But we can't just look at the rental side of the picture. We need to also look at what we can do to expand the opportunities for people to uh, buy a home should they wish to. Now, there's things that we put in place before around the first home savings account, which has now seen more than 750,000 young people sign up to have a tax-free opportunity to save away for that down payment. 
We're going to have more to say in this on the days ahead, but we're going to continue to focus not just on the need to build more homes, but to create an opportunity for people to get in a home that they can actually afford. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that for a lot of people, housing in the market simply isn't going to be an option. We have to ask ourselves what kind of a country we want to be and whether we want to ensure that everyone who calls himself a Canadian goes to bed with a roof over their head. We have a 30-year history in this country of federal governments washing their hands of the responsibility to invest in affordable housing, and my God, are we paying for it today. There's no need we have to accept that our communities do not have enough homes for the people who live in them. Homelessness is not something that, just we, that we just have to take for granted. It's a direct result of policy decisions that have been taken, and the consequences are predictable. We got back into the space of investing in affordable housing in 2017, and adoption, the adoption of the National Housing Strategy is starting to make a difference, but we know we need to do more. We're going to continue to support the construction of affordable housing, including with the recent billion-dollar investment uh, announced in the fall economic statement. But we also realize that as we have a need to build more homes, including affordable housing for low-income families, we have to protect the stock that exists today. Over the course of the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of homes that were available for low-income families at prices they could afford that have been taken off the market. Sometimes it's a result of a lack of repair and maintenance over that time period. Sometimes it's a result of people buying up the properties so they can renovate them and convert them into market housing that allows them to charge higher rent. We're moving forward with an acquisition fund, the Canadian Rental Protection Fund, so we can empower nonprofits to actually purchase some of these buildings and maintain affordability forever. Now, we also have to think uh, to ourselves, in addition to building out affordable housing, in addition to establishing the acquisition fund, how can we help cities that are addressing uh, the issue of encampments with homelessness uh, that is becoming what feels like a permanent fixture of their community? We'll have additional measures in the upcoming federal budget that are going to help communities who adopt a housing-first approach uh, to dealing with some of the most vulnerable community members. I don't think it's too much for us to envision a Canada where homelessness is not something that we see in the newspapers, but read about in our history books. If we continue to listen to people on the ground who are serving vulnerable populations, if we take our lead from people who are feeling the impact of the lack of affordability in the housing market, and importantly, we listen to the people who have a history of building homes, we can solve the housing crisis. It can feel desperate at times when you look at the scale of a problem, but ultimately the solutions are staring us in the face. We only need to work with the people who know how to implement them. I'm very proud to be a part of a team that's going to work alongside the Canadians who are going to solve the housing crisis, and I invite everybody in the room to join me in the months ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister Fraser. I'm Danielle McGee. I'm a director with the Canadian Club of Ottawa, and I'm also the senior advisor of government and stakeholder relations at Ottawa Community Housing. The next part of this event is a fireside chat with Minister Fraser as we delve further into how the federal government can help solve the housing crisis, including how they can work with our municipalities and with all of us in the housing sector to make a real impact. The person who will be joining us on stage to participate in the fireside chat understands that housing affordability is one of the largest challenges many people are facing right across the country. <clears throat> people are seeing the cost of rent rising, home ownership becoming more unaffordable, and the need for investment in non-market and not-for-profit housing becoming more critical. To continue this important conversation, we have with us today Carol Saab. Carol is the, F uh, sorry, the CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and she's been there for almost four years. During her time as CEO, she's positioned FCM as one of the most effective advocacy organizations in Canada and is widely respected by government officials. FCM has been working very hard alongside many of us to take action on community and affordable housing needs so all Canadians have a place to live. This is why we're grateful that she can be with us today, and I know we all look forward to the discussion ahead. Please join me in welcoming Carol Saab.
Thank you uh, very much, Danielle, and thank you to the minister uh, for being here and for giving us uh, a lot to dig into in this conversation in the next little while. Um, just a quick, uh, for those of you who don't know FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, we represent uh, over 2,100 cities and communities from coast to coast to coast, from the biggest city in the country to our small towns um, and rural and remote regions as well as over 93% of the Canadian population. Um, and we are the national voice uh, for local government uh, in this country. Um, and I just want to acknowledge, I know uh, it was referenced earlier, but Mayor Sutcliffe uh, here in the room with us, as well as FCM Vice President, City Councilor Tim Tierney, um, and FCM Board Member Lane Johnson, Ottawa City Councilor as well. Um, as fair warning, I bring a posse with me, Minister, when I have to go somewhere, just in case this goes sideways up here for, <laughs> for us. Um, and there are a number of other uh, municipal councillors here in the crowd. Um, I said to the minister just as we were coming in, you've been busy, thank you, and uh, I'll say that in front of this room, it's been a busy two weeks uh, for you, minister, and months and months of work leading into that, um, with major housing announcements, as you've outlined in your opening remarks, um, and so I think let's start there and maybe give you an opportunity to further delve into um, what impact you are hoping that the, these most recent announcements will drive, uh, especially in solving the housing cri crisis in Canada, um, and what challenges do you think are our biggest uh, obstacles to overcome here on the horizon uh, sh sure so look what, what are we hoping to achieve I, I, I don't think it's too much to state that that the goal is to to solve the housing crisis which to me means that uh, people are able to afford a place to live and, and people who aren't able to work uh, still have the supports to be well um, there's enormous costs to ignoring some of the challenges around our most vulnerable in particular and, and we, we should meet their needs on both a moral and economic basis uh, but from my perspective uh, if we put the policies in place that the federal government has the opportunity to implement. Uh, it's going to get us a big part of the way there, but we can't do it alone. Uh, we need good partners, and this is sort of part B of your question is what are the potential obstacles? Um, we need to make sure that we're able to leverage investments from uh, provincial governments, from municipalities, from the private sector, from nonprofit entities, from the charitable sector who wants to support housing growth. And what we're trying to do is lead by example. Uh, there's no time to waste. Every day that we delay uh, is a day we're missing out on an opportunity to seize the economic opportunity that I described in my opening remarks at the, uh, off the top. Um, I do sense that uh, we're at a moment in every part of this country where all of the actors want to achieve the same outcome. There may be a, a disagreements on how we get there. There may be negotiations or conversations we have to have. Uh, but I think it's a very healthy starting point when you agree on the identification of the problem and the need to solve it. And I think that's where we are today. Uh, and there's varying levels of ambition across different provinces in particular, uh, but I see an enormous opportunity to work with partners at other levels of government, to leverage private sector investment, uh, and to support nonprofits for doing the good work on the ground. It's, uh, the, the time to act is now, uh, and uh, we hope over the next few days to reveal a, a plan that will demonstrate the federal government's going to help lead the charge. Great. Um, and I, you've given me a good segue, I think, to make this point, and we'll have an opportunity to dig into the, how, we, how we can better work together across orders of government in a, in a future question. Um, just by way of context in this room, in the moment we're having right now, even this conversation, I think, is, is a sign of progress. You know, I, in my role, I have very um, privileged opportunities to have conversations with federal ministers off a stage and to, to try to advance um, the interests of cities and communities. Um, but it's not very often that we have an opportunity to, to as someone from from uh, representing one order of government to talk to a federal minister in such a public setting. And I think it's a sign of exactly what you've just said, Minister, that there is a, a reckoning across all orders of government and understanding that we have to come together, that there needs we need to work together um, in order to deliver the outcomes Canadians are counting on, particularly as we face something as stark as the housing crisis in this country. Um, and I, you know, we've we've you referenced the six billion dollar uh, municipal infrastructure fund to support housing enabling infrastructure, um, which is significantly uh, needed and huge progress. And and uh, FCM and our members uh, across the country really really welcomed it um, and appreciated. And I think it was recognition in, as well that you cannot build housing without housing enabling infrastructure, water, wastewater, and so forth. Um, and so we appreciate the federal government's leadership on that. 
And I, th I know that from previous conversations we've had, Minister, you've also had a chance to um, see the ambition at a municipal level through the response to the Housing Accelerator Fund in your conversations with how municipalities are, are really looking for tools to grow the housing supply um, going forward. And I think part of the reality, and you won't be surprised where I want to take this next question on sort of a long-term um, conversation as well, part of the reality is because municipalities are dealing with such a limited set of tools. Um, you know, we have property taxes, uh, development charges, which um, I, there are some changes to as well, which I, again, appreciate the objective there, share the objective to build more housing. Um, but pragmatically, it's another set of tools for some of our biggest cities that are, are being removed. Um, and while we see federal and provincial revenue through the income and sales tax going up, municipal revenue um, in, the, in the context of all of the growth that is happening um, has not only just stagnated when you account for inflation, it's actually gone down by, by over 3.5%. And so we have this sort of cyclical challenge as a nation um, where, we, where we're in this conversation about what's the next iteration of how we're going to fund infrastructure in this country. Um, and I think, you know, again, I cannot under, underscore enough the importance of this $6 billion investment. Um, and I think we're also uh, really looking to what's the future vision for how infrastructure long term is funded in this country. Um, because I think we can both agree that this kind of cyclical nature of, of how we do it is isn't the most um, efficient or effective way of, of delivering it for Canadians. And so I want to start on that conversation. You know better than most, I think, that FCM has really been advocating for um, a conversation, a national conversation on a growth framework um, to help better align and give municipalities uh, access to revenue tools that grow with the economy. Um, and so there, there, the question really to you, Minister, is, is how can we work together on that? How do you, how do you see that conversation unfolding? Um, and how do we have have it across orders of government. Um, certainly, our ask is for that to be in the in the upcoming federal budget. But we're we're really looking um, to, to you. And I guess my question to you is, how do you see the federal role in, in that conversation? Uh, look, th thanks for the question. I think it's an important one too that we need to figure out collectively as a society if we're going to maximize the the public good that comes from the infrastructure investments that we do make. So, if you'll in indulge me for a, a minute or two, I'll, I'll share first what's happening now and, and what may be one day. Um, we need to act now, we need to act swiftly. <clears throat> the uh, $6 billion that we've announced last week is going to include a $1 billion tranche that's going to be deployed immediately this fiscal year targeting shovel-ready projects that will help get more housing built with municipalities that are, are ready to go. The second tranche of it is a $5 billion fund because we want to work with provincial governments to meet some of their uh, priorities over the next number of years, uh, but we want to make sure that we're getting something in exchange to maximize the return on that investment, including uh, making changes that will help reduce the cost of maintaining infrastructure along the lines of what I mentioned uh, with zoning changes and doing what they can to uh, prevent further increases to the kinds of development charges that are going to make it tougher to build homes. When I see some cities in this country have DCs that are approaching six figures, and I think when I started as an MP, you could buy some homes in my community for less than what development charges cost today. Uh, it's not a sustainable path if we want to benefit fully from the growth potential that I see Canada has. Um, in addition to the announcements that we've made previously, we haven't lost sight of the fact that we need to focus on climate resiliency through programs like the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, community assets through programs like the Green Inclusive Community Building Fund, and we can leverage an enormous financing opportunity through the Canada Infrastructure Bank, who's recently started to engage on housing enabling infrastructure with their first announcement along these lines in uh, Manitoba very recently. Now, that's what we are doing now and over the next uh, uh, number of months and years. Uh, but I think to your point, what I would love to see, not so much as today's Minister of Housing, but a Canadian who really cares about the future of the country, is three levels of government working together to develop holistic community plans. Uh, there's not a reason that we shouldn't be working together to understand what size should a community be? What size do the community want to be in the next number of years? What services they need uh, that are typically the responsibility of the provincial government when it comes to hospitals and education facilities? Uh, what supports can the federal government contribute to to make sure we're building complete communities with access to transit services, recreational properties? If we're not having these conversations at a community level across all three levels of government, it's going to be impossible to design programs that will support that outcome. 
Uh, I'm intrigued, though this is not formal government policy, as you're well aware today, uh, Carol, uh, by, by the proposal that you're advocating for around a new kind of municipal growth framework. I have some hesitancy about saying, yes, we're just going to step up and shift some of the economic growth that the federal government experiences direct to cities without making sure there's changes being made at the cities that will ensure we reduce the cost of home building and build communities that are, are livable and better, uh, are better, better able to manage their finances as a result of some of the changes we made. So part of the conversation from my perspective has to include proper asset management plans, proper zoning to ensure we're getting bang for the buck, uh, making sure that we are uh, building out communities communities that we can actually sustain that doesn't compromise on the ability for people to access the services and opportunities that they need. So I think over the next number of years, there may be space for a much bigger conversation about how communities can reliably fund, uh, receive funding across levels of government. Uh, but in my view, it only makes sense for the federal government to be a partner in this space if we're pursuing a common vision for what a co complete community looks like that's fed into uh, by the three levels of government. And importantly, the people who live in those communities who don't much care whose jurisdiction it is when they have an important need, uh, they just want to make sure they live in a community where those needs can be met. Uh, so we don't want to wait. Uh, and let perfection be the enemy of progress. Uh, we want to act now to build what we can now with the tools that are available, uh, but this is a conversation I'm personally interested in carrying on uh, this week and, and next after the budget as well. That's great. Um, and it's a, it's a perfect lead into um, a softball question around the provincial role minister <laughs> as we go forward. Um, you certainly, I think, have my agreement, as you know, and, and that of our members, that solving the housing crisis is going to take all orders of government um, at the table. And, and when we look at the Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund um, and new housing initiatives from your government, um, there is a critical role, and I agree, a necessary role for provinces and territories as well as part of, as part of those programs. Um, and we've seen that that has been, um, you know, that there's different levels of ambition across the country. And that that has been um, met with varying challenges across the country as well. And so I guess the best way to frame the question um, from, from my perspective is really what do you see as the federal role um, in leading these priorities and, and facilitating that kind of collaboration um, with the provinces to get this work done? You know, it's an, it's an interesting uh, question because you, you won't find a section in the, the Constitution that uh, puts the responsibility for building water pipes on the federal government. Uh, but we want to help because it's in pursuit of a solution to a problem that we think is impacting the ability of Canadians to fulfill their potential and enjoy lives, uh, their, their lives and their communities the way that we hope they can. Um, the role of the province and, and federal government in this uh, has to be to be good teammates uh, with the communities that, that people live in. Um, now we will occasionally be in front of a camera and be asked, well, somebody said this, you said that, why do you disagree? Truth be told, most of my private conversations, wi without exception uh, across Canada with my ministerial counterparts, uh, starts from a place that we actually do want to build the homes that, that we need. Uh, sometimes the strategies to get there are different. Uh, and where I'm approaching these conversations from is I want to be a good partner. Our role is largely going to be to be a, a, a funding partner in a lot of the projects. Uh, but I don't feel that it's responsible governance on my part to put money on the table and wash my hands of the problem and say, go spend it. I, I want to make sure that the, the Canadians who are paying for this are getting value for the investments. And if the strategy to build more housing is going to be uh, forever extending urban sprawl into areas that currently have no services, have limited economic opportunities, and will force people into longer commutes without uh, building a livable community, uh, I don't think many people uh, at home in my community would be okay with me spending my own money on that or their money on that. Um, but I do think if we're uh, making investments uh, in exchange for commitments that it's going to deliver better housing out outcomes and healthier communities, uh, those are things that people tell me when I go knock doors in my community they want to see. Uh, so my role is to uh, play a, a leadership role in demonstrating what we want to achieve. Uh, having sometimes difficult conversations with counterparts on how we think we should achieve it, even though it might require new approaches to old problems, uh, even though it may not be exactly what somebody wanted to hear when we walk into the conversation at the outset, but if we can bring people together in pursuit of a common vision for uh, a Canada that has enough homes for the people who live here now and the people who will live here in the future, uh, in a way that will maximize their quality of life and drive economic opportunities, uh, then I think it's, it's uh, healthy for us to be at the table and it's valuable 
valuable for us to say uh, we do insist on certain kinds of changes uh, that are going to deliver better results for Canadians. Uh, we're not just into cutting checks and cutting ribbons. Uh, we want to solve the problem. Yeah, thanks, Mr. And I, I very much agree with the sentiment as well that, um, you know, for most Canadians, um, there isn't the luxury of an academic exercise around jurisdiction and the Constitution and that there is an expectation, and I think a fair one, for orders of government to just get together and, and get the job done um, on the part of Canadians. And, and uh, you know, I, I'll just give a nod here to the fact that um, some really impressive things happened uh, during the very hard time of the pandemic where governments were able to work across jurisdictions, across sectors um, to really deliver for Canadians in a moment where they needed to. And, and I'm struck by the fact that as a country we can't go through something um, as truly awful as that and not, not at least learn from the silver lining lessons that came from it, which is that we can do this across orders of government. And certainly, um, if anything behooved us all collectively to move, it, it would be addressing the housing crisis um, as we go forward. Um, I'll share the, you know, I want to move into the space and I, w I was um, really pleased to hear your reference to it in your earlier remarks as well around um, non-market housing and, and addressing the needs um, of the most vulnerable in this country as well as um, really a, a optimistic vision for ending chronic homelessness in this country. and. Um, I can tell you, you know, I know firsthand that we're seeing um, the issue of homelessness uh, really uh, exacerbated across the country, not just in big cities, but in small towns from coast to coast to coast. Um, Courtney, BC, Summerside, PEI, Timmins, Ontario. I mean, real, real um, issues around homelessness and and uh, communities struggling to to do this, um, to do this. And and Canada, I think, as you said, um, for uh, because of a history here, um, doesn't have sufficient non-market affordable housing and. So supportive housing supply, which really are critical to addressing our current housing and homelessness crisis, um, and which we know impact equity-deserving groups more uh, acutely as well. Um, municipalities certainly are uh, really driven uh, to address this crisis and are, are moving fast to, to uh, f offer funding, offer land, fast track of pr approvals, um, really try to address this crisis full hand. And I know some of the recent measures that you've announced, the Rental Protection Fund, um, an important piece to protect renters in this as well. Um, I heard you give a bit of a nod, a bit of a preview to in days coming that there'll be more on this piece. And I guess I'm, I'm trying to tease out a little bit more from you in this conversation. Um, if you can share anything else that your government is planning to really address the needs along the housing continuum, um, particularly on supportive and affordable non-market housing. Uh, sure, and just, just to demonstrate the, the scale of the problem, though homelessness and housing prices are, are creating pressures in many countries around the world, uh, non-market housing in Canada is facing a unique challenge. Uh, so Canada's total housing market has about 16.5 million homes. Uh, about 4% uh, exist outside of the market uh, setting, so are reserved for uh, uh, public housing initiatives that support low-income families. Uh, that's about half of the average OECD country. And we've got to ask ourselves, as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and despite the challenges that families are facing, Canada uh, at a macroeconomic level remains one of the healthiest uh, countries and, and uh, best and strongest economies globally. We have to ask ourselves, uh, are we willing to accept that? Uh, and if not, what changes are we willing to make? Um, we're going to continue to support, through increased investments, uh, affordable housing for low-income families outside of a market setting. Uh, it's integral to who we are and what we believe as a government, and so long as we have an opportunity to uh, be on the government side of the House of Commons, I expect you're going to see continued investment in non-market housing. Uh, but we have to do more through the Rental Protection Fund to make sure we don't lose the housing stock that is organically affordable today, that exists uh, in our communities. Uh, my own community is actually struggling right now with the uh, uh, closure for, for safety reasons uh, of a building that was condemned uh, that has um, had seven paying tw uh, tenants and, and 20 other people who were living there. It wasn't safe. Uh, and uh, a lot of these people don't know where they're going to go. Uh, it's going to be a few months before our next affordable housing project opens up. Uh, but we have to realize that if we are just building to replace what's closing, we're treading water. Uh, we need to make sure that we uh, plug the drain in the tub, <laughs> so to speak, uh, to ensure we don't lose uh, what we already have as we seek to build more. 
in addition to these pieces, uh, when I look at the impact of uh, encampments uh, on vulnerable people who live in our communities, including people I've known uh, my whole life who have had extraordinary potential, who've run into really serious challenges with mental health and addictions, um, we don't have to accept uh, that encampments are part of our communities or the destiny for certain members of our communities. And I won't feel as though I've solved the housing crisis if I have to walk past an encampment on my way to an event in cities across this country. Uh, we can transition people to safe and durable housing solutions. There's also groups that the federal government, in my view, has a unique uh, obligation to serve. Uh, I think about um, Indigenous Canadians who have been dealing with overcrowding. Surely your, your story struck a chord with me, um, not just because it's so powerful for the example that you gave, but because it's so common for so many Indigenous people in this country. Uh, it's not fair, it's not right, we don't have to accept it. And to change it, it will take billions of dollars of investments, but we're willing to make them. Uh, we are rolling out now a $4 billion fund to directly support uh, nations, uh, Inuit communities, uh, Métis uh, communities across Canada uh, to meet the needs of their community members. We're also working to establish a new program to meet the needs of uh, Indigenous peoples who live in urban, rural and northern environments who may no longer have a connection to the community that they came from historically or even over the course of their lives. And I also think about um, the challenge we see with uh, veterans who don't have a place to live. If we can afford to send our citizens to war, we can afford to take care of them when they come home. We have a moral obligation to serve certain populations who don't fit neatly into provincial jurisdiction, and even if they did, I believe we should serve their needs anyway. Uh, we're willing to make the investments necessary, but doing it is harder than saying it. Uh, we have to work with people who are implementing solutions on the ground. We have to understand the needs of the populations we're trying to serve. But it's a choice that we have standing before us. And there are widely varying political opinions on this with people who are elected in the House of Commons as to whether the federal government should be in the business of building homes at all. My view is today and forever will be, yes, we do. We have a moral responsibility. And you'll find that it's cheaper to address the problem than it is to ignore it. Somebody who goes to bed without a roof over their head is going to run into more challenges with the emergency room. They're going to put more strain on the mental health services that our entire communities depend upon. They're going to run into challenges with law enforcement and tie up the resources of the court more often. They're also not going to fill their economic potential because when you're looking for a place to go to bed, you are not looking for a job. All of us suffer when we don't meet the needs of the most vulnerable. It is something that I believe we have a moral obligation to address, and it's in our economic interest to do it at the same time. So you should expect to see a continued series of investments, not just over the next few days, but over the next number of years, and so long as we have an opportunity to remain in government. Thanks very much, Minister, and that's a, a very encouraging answer, and I can tell you the level of ambition um, is met uh, by municipal governments. I, I talk to um, everyday mayors across the country who go to bed at night uh, staying up thinking about how on earth they're going to put a roof over the head of the community members they see um, in their communities. And so um, this is another conversation, again, provincial wraparound support's key to this, but another conversation um, about how we can collectively get things done that, that I agree we have a moral obligation to do. Um, I'm seeing uh, Mohammed standing here giving me a very polite signal <laughs> um, to go and so I'll just uh, end by uh, thanking you Minister for uh, this conversation um, but also for the leadership in action that we've been seeing you and your government take um, in this space and we look forward to working together. Thank you so much everyone it's a pleasure.